proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are live. We are on. So guess what we're also going to do? We're going to do one more quick prayer because we have a number of things to pray about together as they collect the uh, uh, cups and everything. Thank you for celebrating with us. Father, once again, may you be glorified today. May this be a day that we are so joyful and rejoicing because you have made it and it is for you and to you that we celebrate life today. Thank you for bringing your people together and for those who are assembling here this morning. And we pray once again, as we've already prayed for healing for a number of our folks, we pray for a continued recovery. It's so good to see my brother Tim Triplett here, and we ask that you would just please help him as he continues to recover. Father, I, we're, just, we're just grateful at your power. And we know that you have great and mighty things in store for those who love you. And we've already celebrated part of the joy of our salvation, which is what was done for us on the cross. May we honor you and worship you today in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, welcome. We are in part two of the As We Gather series that we kind of entered into. And the last two Sundays, uh, my preaching times have been short. And the weird part is more people have viewed last week's sermon for, than ever. <laughs> which I might want to take that as a, as a hint there. Uh, shorten it, buddy. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I do know that it really resonated with a number of people that we are doing a, a series about what does it mean to gather together as the body of Christ. And it also is very significant in our day because more people than ever before, I think, are forsaking fellowshipping together with the body of Christ. Maybe you know people they used to be faithful in coming to a, uh, to a church gathering or, or any kind of Bible study or anything where believers can get together and fellowship and do the one another's. That's what we have. There's no way to do those things on our own uh, in terms of the commands of Scripture of how we ought to be treating and interacting with the members, the fellow members of the body of Jesus Christ. You have to assemble together corporately to do that. In Hebrews 10.25, we're going to keep bringing that verse up, and that is, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the custom of some. And I would sort of say that extends to the custom of many in today's church, is that they don't want to come out anymore. It's not worth the drive or the gas money or getting out of bed. And some people have some issues and beef with other people in the, in the church. We're going to be dealing with that in this series, because you need to squash that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ if you have beef with somebody else who's your brother and sister in Christ. You need to be the one to extend forgiveness and reconciliation and anything that needs to happen in order to have that wonderful, glorious, functioning unity among each other. Now, I will have to say, I believe this is a very loving congregation and a loving church for the most part, but we're all stinkers. Every single one of us, man, every single one of us have issues, and we have these little things and quirks about our personality and let's just say it we struggle with sin and so guess what you're not going to see the best side of us all the time when we're together isn't that isn't that the, the sad truth but again if you go into a congregation where everybody's perfect and they're sitting there with with this plastered smile on their face and oh everything's fine and you, you look like you've entered the village of the damned you know this weird <laughs> collective robotic uh, hive of people that are super happy all the time no, wait a minute. That's not real either. That's not the body of Jesus Christ. We're all fallen, man, and without Jesus, we're nothing. And we, we need to be coming together in a humble understanding and embracing of our need for the Lord Jesus and our proclamation that he is the head of the church. I'm excited about the church. As I look into Scripture, as we looked last week, uh, starting in Genesis 3, about the fact that there's a war going on, and if you've been uh, called out of this sinful world, your father was the devil, sin was your master, and you were a slave to your own flesh and appetites in the demonic realm, but Jesus rescued you from that. He called you out of that. Now you're a special, peculiar, very strange people, but you're pilgrims passing through to a glorious eternity that the rest of the world without Christ is going to destruction. You have been called out of that. 
And that is, that is something that you better never let diminish in your heart in terms of celebration. Thank you, Jesus, because you didn't deserve it. But he's building his church, and he's using you as a living member and a living stone on a foundation that is Christ himself. This is heavy stuff. This is the, the biggest dynamic and description of you in this life. Are you in Christ or not? Biggest decision you'll ever make. Biggest allegiance that you'll ever have much more important than any other choice in life is are you going to choose to receive what jesus did for you by faith to believe in god and put your trip faith and trust in whom he sent his son as the way the truth the life there it is if you're not in christ you are in trouble that is true you are in peril at this very moment so please make sure Please do that. We looked at how this blessing, you know, it's already being talked about in the Old Testament, although in a hidden form, that there's some blessing going from Israel to all the nations, and it's Messiah. It's Israel's Messiah. He's the Savior of the whole world for any Gentile who will come to him. Any of the goyim in Hebrew, the nations, the people groups, it doesn't matter at what far reaches of this planet you find yourself on, you're not too far out of God's reach, but you must turn to him and repent and believe in the gospel. Amen? And the gospel is powerful, and it has permeated every continent on this planet. We still have people groups that have yet to hear about Jesus. He's going to reach them. It's going to get to them. Everybody gets a chance to accept and believe in the revelation of the gospel. We believe that by faith. It's that powerful. But already in the Old Testament, we read a passage last time. Go with me now to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. I can, I can smell a part three coming on here with this. We're not, we're not, we don't have time to to go to all the references that I think we need to look at. This, these are beautiful. But is it wasted time if we're in the Word? No. L listen to this wonderful proclamation in Isaiah 49 and, and, and see if you can't hear God's plan for something that we now know is called the church. Remember then, it's an idea and a concept that what do you mean God's going to reach Gentiles? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to extend his love and forgiveness and, 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 and extend repentance to Gentiles who will turn to him. Well, we already saw this even back in Old Testament Israel, didn't we? Where a God-fearing Gentile who's going to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, well, they could come. They could be numbered in that congregation in the wilderness, if you will. But Isaiah 49 speaks of a, a time of the spread of the power of the gospel. And verses 1 through 9 of Isaiah 49. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, and from the body of my mother he named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has concealed me, and he has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Who's speaking here? The Messiah. Mashiach is telling the nations... And that's a euphemism, islands and all the peoples from afar. That's everybody who's non-Jewish. That's everybody who's outside the boundaries of the land, of Haaretz. Listen, in Messiah, you're being invited to come to God. It says here, verse uh, 3, he said to me, God said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have toiled in vain. And I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now, says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, is it, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also make you a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Praise God. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise, princes will also bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a favorable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. 
and I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate heritages, saying to those who are bound, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Along the roads they will feed, and their pasture will be on all bare heights. And then it just keeps talking about all these promises here. Any who is going to turn to Israel is going to get restored and fed and taken care of and shepherded. Any who are going to turn to the God of Israel from the nation will be saved. And beloved, that's you and me here this morning. There's some of you in here who obviously have Jewish blood, a Jewish inheritance, but you know what? Salvation is always by grace through faith. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And that's everyone. And all of us in here are an extension of God's glorious plan called the church. And listen, it's not a plan B. It wasn't that God goes, oh, no, look what just happened in the garden. And on the slopes of Mount Hermon is the Genesis 6 watcher's sin. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Oh, I got it. I'll bring this thing called the church into it. No, God always knew that this was going to happen. He always knew that every single one of us, Jew or Gentile, would need rescued from the fall and from the iniquity that entered into life on earth under the sun in this cursed creation. Amen? How grateful are you, are you that you've been rescued from that? How grateful are you that you've been called out of that? Now, we're still talking about this, this Old Testament gem of the fact that God's going to save Gentiles. But go with me to the book of Romans. Go with me to Romans 15 quickly this morning. Such an exciting, amazing treatise here. Paul does this about five or six times in his 13 letters. And by that, I mean he does what is called pearl stringing pearl stringing. Think of a jeweler taking precious pearls, and what's he doing? He's putting it on a, on a string or a chain, and he's making this beautiful necklace, this beautiful jewelry that would then adorn somebody and just make them radiate. Ladies, don't you love to be frosted, right? You got your, your gold and your bling and your, your beautiful stuff on. And, and again, what, what's going on here? A pearl necklace is valuable. So the rabbis, and I'll say this carefully, okay? No, Leah, let me rephrase what I just said. Forget rabbis, okay? They came after the fact, and rabbinic Judaism is not something you should follow or get into. But some of them pointed back to Hillel, who came up with the seven midoth of Midrash, which is these Jewish interpretation principles. One of them is, and we can identify these from the scriptures, is that Paul engaged in these practices. Why? He sat on, under the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel, Okay, so we understood these principles. What am I talking about? Here's what I'm saying. The Bible's a Jewish book. Amen? Paul was a Jew. So in his writings and in the teachings and practices of Jesus Christ, you also see these principles of Midrash. You see these Jewish themes being recapitulated and always used and, and, and resurfacing in the writings of Holy Scripture. Romans 15 is a great example of about four or five other places where Paul takes little verses from the Old Testament and he just strings them together like a pearl necklace. So what we call pearl stringing. That's what we're looking at here. Romans 15. Uh, let's go to verse 7. You'll see what I mean. But here's what we really want to look at. at what this, what, that's what Paul's doing. But understand, what is he doing here? He's affirming that the church has its roots and basis in the Old Testament, in a manner of speaking. How do we know that? Because he's preaching to the church in Romans, and he's taking these little pearl verses and stringing them together to make a case that God has been revealing truths the whole time. Okay? Follow me on this. This is really good. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, look at Romans 15, starting in verse 7. To the church, Paul writes, Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Folks, we could do a five-week series on that verse right there. What does it mean to accept one another like Christ accepted us? Okay. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. There's the very Jewish-centric picture of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's a servant to the Jews, okay? 
and he's confirming the prophetic promises given to the fathers. You cannot unhitch from the Old Testament when we look at the New. Right? Not about the life and ministry of our Lord, nor about any of the prophetic truths. Verse 9, And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. And that's where we get this beautiful unity in the church. We have Christ sent for the Jews to, to fulfill specific things, and we have Christ sent to the Gentiles as well. And what, all, what, what does it cause all of us to do, Jew or Gentile? Glorify God. This is so good. What we're experiencing here this morning, this fellowship, this unity, this coming together for a reason and a purpose, you're here for Jesus. Why? Because he deserves the glory, and you're here to glorify God the Father for sending Jesus. And every time, yeah, that's why we don't want to miss a time where we can come together and corporately do that together. There's power in numbers. And we're in a war. Remember that. Here, this is our platoon, man. This is our squad. This is our contingent of warriors empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ to stand against the darkness of this age. Why? Because he's called us out of it, and we know the way out. Oh, this is good. Look at how Paul does this. And we're going to go... One verse at a time here. In verse 9, for the Gentiles to glorify God for his, verse, for his mercy. And then Paul says this, indicating the beginning of the pearl necklace. He says, as it is written, number 1, verse 9, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. Where did he get that? 2 Samuel 22.50, as David exclaims that, and then the Psalm of David, Psalm 18.49. That's what he's quoting. Pearl number 1. Isn't that a pretty one? That's a beautiful one. Oh, he strings it together with verse 10. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Verse 10 is a direct quote of Deuteronomy 32, 43. There's another little pearl for the necklace. Verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Well, what's he quoting there? Psalm 117, verse 1, third pearl in the necklace. I love this. I love what he's doing. Verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Psalm 11, 10, he's quoting there. Verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you go all the way to verse 21, which he's talking about this idea of the Gentiles being blessed in Christ. And he says in verse 21, as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who shall have not heard shall understand. Again, a prophecy from Isaiah 52, 15. Does Paul know how to put together a nice piece of jewelry or what? That's what he's doing. Just recognize that every time you see Paul begin to just kind of throw out these quotes from the Old Testament, oh, they're all connected, and they're all what? Backing up his point, backing up his point that what? Then the Old Testament spoke prophetically of this beautiful thing called the church or ecclesia. Now, we have a few minutes left, and we're going to do the impossible with talking about a word and the word is called ekklesia in the Greek. Everybody say ekklesia, right? It's the root of where we get the theological term ecclesiology, the study of the church, or ecclesiastical, things pertaining to the church. Ecclesia means called out ones. That's the literal meaning is to mean called out, okay? Ek and kaleo, two words put together, and it, it means called out. Now, it can mean a popular meeting, but especially some sort of a religious congregation. Think about the synagogue which met in those days. That was a ecclesia, a called-out group of people. It's a gathering or throng called out to a public place. It can even be, as in Acts 19, verse 32, and Acts 19, 41, an angry mob. And some churches feel like angry mobs, am I right? Like some churches, it doesn't mean always in the Greek a gathering that's always religious. It can be a gathering of people to, you know, kill somebody or to lynch them, all right? But that's, that's a way to use this. But we're talking about in our context, and for the most part of the way that this word is used in the scriptures, is a religious context. It's the saints on earth gathering or 
the saints in heaven, all of which are called out from the world and called to God. It's the total body of believers called out of the world and to the kingdom of God. It's the invisible, and some would call this, although I don't like the word because of the loaded nature of what it's become, the mystical church or the visible church. We can see people who call themselves Christians are part of a visible church, but not everybody in the visible church is actually in Christ. Isn't that frightening? We'll get to that at some point. But the invisible portion of that, and again, some theologians have used the word mystical, meaning you can't see it. It's kind of this gathering that's known to God primarily. Okay, He knows who are his, even among those who call themselves Christians. Do you understand? But do you see how deep this word ecclesia goes? But the, the, the fundamental, it's the called out. And this is what I love about Matthew 16. Guys, could we have the first slide up here? We have a slide of the Holy Land. See that beautiful snow-capped mountain in the, in the distance there? Okay, we're going to start at the summit and work our way down. That's Mount Hermon, snow-capped much of the year in Israel there. And that is allegedly the site... I think we have another picture after this of Mount Hermon. There it is, a little bit closer. This was taken from a lookout there, uh, looking over into what would be Syria, I think, behind the mount there. Okay, But Mount Hermon is allegedly the place that the fallen angels, and by some traditions say 200 of them, gathered together to make this plan to come down onto the earth and take human women as their wives. And, of course, go in and have children by them, which become these hybrid Nephilim beasts, okay? It, it was, it's a creepy story, but it's, it's forever for real true. I don't know about all the details, whether there were only 200 of them, but in the initial group, that's an, initially what happened on the summit of this mountain. Now, that's, that's important because for centuries then, this mountain has been looked at in, in, a, in a double thing because most probably this is where Jesus went to be transfigured right, to show his glory to two of his disciples. Now, we will talk deeper about that when we get back into the Gospels. But there's a reason that Jesus went to the summit of this mountain, most probably in order to reveal himself in that way. We don't have time to get into that today. But that mountain has a connotation of cursing and of covenant because the covenant was made with the fallen angels. Let's go down and do this thing, and we're certainly going to get punished for it, but let's go do it anyway. And now they're in chains of darkness because they're the angels who sinned, spoken of us uh, in the letter of Peter and Jude. Okay, Let's go to the next slide. At the foothills of this mountain. Now, I was, I'll tell you, because I'm a geek in this area, right? I was immensely uh, excited to go here. All right, This is at the foothills all the way down on this slope here at the bottom of the mountain. It's in the city called Caesarea Philippi, or Philippi. I heard it pronounced both ways. I don't know which one is right. But bottom line is the emperor decided to revive a pagan worship here of the god Pan. Everybody heard of Pan. The city was called Banias, which was named after the goat god Pan. If you've all seen the picture of the guy with the horns and the goat legs and he's playing a flute, Pan pipes, right? You've heard of that, right? What's he known for? Sleeping with lots of people and doing whatever he wants to do and partying. And he's evil, okay? Even looks evil, doesn't he? Looks, he, he come, come, some of the imagery of Satan comes from Pan, okay? The emperor wants to revive Pan worship in his empire because it had fallen out of favor. So he institutes a temple here, puts it there. Guys, let's show one more picture. This is what it would have looked like in the days of Jesus. So you saw the cave there. And there's where it would have had a, uh, like an entrance there all the way to the left where they would go in and do a worship rite and then some other celebration here, okay? This is what Caesarea Philippi was known for. This is what Bonius was known for, and it was dedicated to the god Pan, a false, satanic, demonic spirit. How do we know it's demonic? And we don't have time to go into all of it today. The rituals that they carried out in that temple in the days of Jesus Christ are so foul I won't tell them to you here, but they involve children and goats and all kinds of horrible things. As gross and as low as you can go and as wicked, and it ended with the killing of these children or these goats, slit throats thrown into that cave at the back of that temple. In the cave was a whirlpool in the, fed by a subterranean underground stream. 
And you can't see in this slide or the other one, but there's a river that actually flowed out of the mouth of that cave. And an earthquake changed that, but the river still comes out from where it used to come. Now, in the winter, they believed their gods, including Pan, died and were you know, resting in this cave until spring when everybody comes alive and you know what happens, right? So they would do these horrible, gross ritual sacrifices and throw kids and goats in there. And if the gods accepted those sacrifices, then the waters that ran out of that would be clear. The blood wouldn't be in there. If the blood flowed out through the waters, and you can go there and see the, the, the waters there that, that lead up to the cave, then it meant their sacrifice wasn't accepted. But the bottom line is, is that gross? Yes. And there's the altar of the dancing goats right next to it, which is this other white part over here. We won't go into that. We're going to we're gonna have to talk about this when we get to the life of Christ. Here's, here's the big thing that we're going to finish with today, okay? Go to the next slide, guys. This is in the walls right next to the big cave that I showed you, okay? These are where the idols of Pan or whatever other gods they were worshiping would be put into the site. I took all these pictures because this, this place is immensely fascinating to me. Here's why. In the days of Christ, this was known, and if you look at history, you'll see seven places at least that have been designated this across our planet, the gates of what? Hell or Hades. The cave to the underworld wherein their demonic spirits dwell and then come out during the spring, all right? Creepy stuff, am I right? So you can imagine the, the disciples of Christ as Jesus leads them there. As we pick this up in Matthew 16, he goes in. There's no real good reason for good Jews to go to Caesarea Philippi anywhere near where this is at, but this is what it's known for. That's the city where there's the gates of Hades there. The gates of the underworld are there. The gates of hell are there. Why? And, and look at all the evil stuff they do. Did you imagine the disciples must kind of be thinking, what are we doing here? And I love this part of the narrative. In Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 13. We know this well. We're going to pick this up more in depth when we get to this portion in the Gospels. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And I love this, because this is the crucial question to this very hour that you better answer for yourself. If you're listening online today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, this is what you have to come to terms with in your life at this point. If you do know the Lord Jesus, that means you have come to terms with this question. Look at what he says. He says, I don't care, in effect, he's saying, I don't care what everybody else says. Because he says, what's the popular opinion of who I am? And they had all these answers. Always oh, this prophet come back from the dead. Always oh, this guy. Always oh, that guy. Oh, it's John the Baptist. It's this and that. Jesus goes, no, 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 but who do you say that I am? Isn't that the question of the hour? Isn't that the question that every man, woman, and child on the face of this planet who draws breath has to answer for themselves? Who do you say that I am? Because the matter, it, it, it matters. Theology matters. Christology matters. Who you say Jesus is matters because if your Jesus isn't the Jesus as described in Scripture, you got the wrong guy, man. And you will die for that. You will be punished eternally for dying with the wrong Jesus. And that includes the person who goes, well, I don't think there is a Jesus. Then you're in trouble, man. Amen? All the Mormons, oh, he was the, the spirit brother of Lucifer. Dude, you're in trouble. The Jehovah's Witnesses, oh, he's really the Archangel Michael who's not really God. No, you're in trouble. He's a lesser God. No, you're in trouble. Oh, he's the New Age Christ who's coming back to ascend. All no, right? Right? Oh, he's the nice moral teacher who really tolerates everybody. No. You better repent all day long, baby in sackcloth and ashes because it matters who you say he is. Do you get that? That's what he's telling his disciples. Now think about it. He's breathing the air of Bonius when he's saying this. They're in the spot where the gates of hell is and Jesus says these wonderful words. Well, Simon says these words first. Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered. Now Peter said a lot of stuff. 
And some of it was really boneheaded. This isn't one of those times. A few verses later, he's going to say something, and Jesus is going to go, get behind me, Satan. All right? So this is no guarantee that Peter's got it all right all the time. He's definitely not the first pope. We'll get to that in a second. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? If that's your Jesus, you're, you're, you got the right one. Jesus affirms that. Jesus said to him, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, rock or little stone. This is a nickname Jesus gives him. In Aramaic, it's Kepha or Cephas in the Greek. Peter is Jesus' nickname for Kepha, okay? He says, you are Petros, you are, and he's, what he's doing is a play on words here, okay? So he says, you are a little stone, in verse 18, and upon this Petra, a different word, related but different. Look at what he's saying. You're the little stone, but on this massive boulder, or on this foundational bedrock. Think Matthew 7, the wise man builds his house upon a rock, meaning on bedrock, which unless you live in California is generally pretty solid. Okay? But what is it? Peter, you're the pebble, but on the rock, I will build my ecclesia, my church. This is so good. Don't miss this as we close. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Amen? This is so wonderful. Do not miss what we are a part of in here this morning. It is that which is so powerful that it will thwart all the attacks of the evil one. And the word gates here is, again, it's been noted. It's not just, you know, gates aren't generally offensive, but they stand for authority and power. And we have to understand, hell has authority and power. Hades, the grave, has authority and power. But not for the believer in Jesus Christ. Not to the church. Do you understand that this morning, what Jesus is saying in the very place that every single person would have understood what he said in context? The gates of hell, that cave over there that represents the power and authority of the evil one over all this whole city, what? Will never overpower the church that I'm building. And I'm building it on the rock. Many have said, you know, this is a debated passage, but the rock is not Peter. Peter's the little stone. Jesus is making a play on words. He goes, I'm going for the foundation, baby. I'm going for what you said, which is your confession, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock the church is built on. Amen? Jesus is the foundation of the church. Amen? He is the chief cornerstone, as our brother read this morning, which I love that you read that passage, because I had that down here. And you're going to go on your own because we're out of time. 1 Corinthians 3.11, Ephesians 2.20, and Acts 4.11. Jesus is the stone rejected by the builders, but he's the cornerstone that's chief. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon the fact that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. And all that hell throws at it will not overcome it. Amen? Let's bow. Father, thank you. We praise you for the church. We praise you for the power demonstrated there in Bonius that day that continues to reverberate into this room which is filled with the saints of the living God this morning. Lord, I pray that everybody in here is truly a member of the body of Christ, truly belongs to you, and is truly a living stone, a little one that's being built into a spiritual house on the foundational, massive stable rock of Jesus Christ who's building it. Amen. Father God, thank you. Bless you. And we affirm that Jesus is calling out many into his body this very hour. Thank you for calling us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.